Hello and welcome to the following revision session on gravitational fields for AQAA level physics. So what we're going to do in this revision session is we're going to review the different concepts of gravitational fields. So we're going to look at the following topics in this revision session. We're going to look at the definition of fields in general. We're going to look at Newton's law of gravitation, gravitational field strength, gravitational potential and orbits of planets and satellites. So the first topic we're going to look at is the general definition of any field in physics. So a field is an important concept to define in the universe. Now a field is a region in the universe where an object placed inside of it can experience a non-contact force due to its position in the field. Now the properties of the field itself are given by the virtual particles of the force interaction, whether that be the um, electromagnetic interaction or whether that be the gravitational interaction. Now objects must contain a certain property to experience a non-contact force inside the field. For example, in gravitational fields, this property is mass, whilst in electrical fields, this property is charge. So uh, what we can know about the gravitational field is as following. It acts on objects with mass, it will extend out to infinity, it exerts weak forces on objects in the field, and it's always producing an attractive force in the field. So any field in physics can be described with four main properties, and the definition of these properties is consistent amongst all fields, whether that be gravitational fields, electrical fields, magnetic fields. So learning these definitions is integral to understanding the physics of any field. So the first property you need to know about is the force law. Now the force law details the, the magnitude of the force exerted between two objects inside the field and it's usually named after a famous scientist who worked in this area of physics. So the second property is field strength, which details the force exerted on one object per unit property of the field due to that object being in the field. Now this is solely down to the field itself which is produced in the universe. So an example of this is gravitational field strength, which is the force per unit mass experienced by an object inside a gravitational field. The third property is potential, which details the energy stored in one object per unit unit property of the field due to the object being in the field, which again is solely down to the field that's produced in the universe. So for example, gravitational potential is the energy per unit mass experienced by an object inside a gravitational field. Now the fourth property is this concept of potential difference, which details the work done moving an object per unit property of the field from one point in the field to another point in the field. So gravitational potential difference is the work done per unit mass experienced by an object moving from one point in the gravitational field to another point in the gravitational field. Now by that token, absolute potential difference details the work done moving an object per unit property of the field from outside the field, which we define as infinity, to a point inside the field. So an example of this is that absolute gravitational potential difference is the work done per unit mass experienced by an object moving from outside the field, infinity, to a point in the field. Now let's get back to this concept of it, the field being a region in the universe where an object placed inside of it can experience a non-contact force. Because all forces in physics can either be categorised as contact forces, forces produced when when objects are physically touching each other, such as friction, air resistance, tension, the normal force, or they can be categorized as non-contact forces, forces produced when objects are physically separated. So examples of non-contact forces are gravitational forces, electrostatic forces, and magnetic forces. Now, objects can can um, exert non-contact forces by transmitting a field in, in space. So like we said before, a field is a region of space where a body can feel a force. So for example, the Earth's gravitational field is a region of space where you can experience the Earth's gravitational force, which are represented in diagrams with field lines as shown on the following diagram. So examples of fields in physics include gravitational fields. So you can see here in this image, you can observe the gravitational field of the Earth. Now the strength of a field is given by its field density. How many field lines are found in a 
certain area. Now, in a field, the closer you are to the object in general, the denser the field lines are, so therefore the stronger the non-contact force exerted on the object placed in that field. Now, just to visualize the gravitational field, we do draw these field lines, which are drawn as straight lines from the object with arrows on them indicating a direction. Now, any massive object inside a gravitational field will experience a gravitational force which is attractive. The objects do not have to be touching for this attractive force to be exerted on the object. Now, different massive objects can have interacting field lines, but they can't overlap. So what this means is field lines from massive objects, objects with a mass, can join up with each other, but they cannot cross. This is because the field lines show the movement of a test mass, a unit mass, where in the field if it was placed at that particular point. So in this example, any test mass would move towards the object producing the gravitational field because gravity is an attractive force. So therefore it tells us that the field lines in gravitational fields are always pointed inwards to the object producing that field because gravity is always an attractive force. Now objects can produce fields of two different shapes, where you've got radial fields and you've got uniform fields. Now a radial field is produced by any particle and a uniform field is, the, is assumed to be the pattern when moving close to a massive object because when you're so close to that particular object it's difficult to observe the curvature of the radial field. But what's the difference in the gravitational field lines produced between the two objects? So in a radial field, the gravitational field lines are pointing in the direction a massive object would take towards the center, the object producing a gravitational field towards the center of mass, uh, but the gravitational field strength decreases with distance in the field. Now in the uniform field, once again, the gravitational field lines point in the direction a massive object would take towards the object producing a gravitational field, but in this instance, the gravitational field strength is constant throughout the field. Now, once again, please remember, the field lines indicate the movement of a massive object placed in the field. So let's, let's now look at Newton's law of gravitation. Now, Newton measured the gravitational force between two massive objects. So this gravitational force is always an attractive force. And he deduced that the magnitude of the force F between the masses M1 and M2 is proportional to the product of M1 and M2, but inversely proportional proportional to the square of the distances between them. So this formed the basis of Newton's law of gravitation. So this means that the relationship between the force produced and the separation is F is equal to 1 over R squared. So when the separation of the two massive objects is doubled, the force exerted decreases by a factor of 4, 2 squared. Now you've got to be able to state both the, the relationships of Newton's law of gravitation as well as state the mathematical equation. So we also, as we are aware that we've got F is directly proportional to M1 times M2, but F is inversely proportional to 1 over R squared, you can combine the two and you can say Newton's law of gravitation is F is equal to G M1 times by M2, the masses of the two objects, which there's a force between, divided by R squared. Now, just to clarify, why is F directly proportional to 1 over R squared? It's because because gravitational fields are radial, which is the case for any gravitational field on a large scale. Now, in this particular um equation, you've got now a new constant, which is g. Now, g is the universal gravitational constant. Now, g is equal to 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 newtons per meter, so newtons meter squared per kilogram squared. Now, this f is the attractive gravitational force acting on each object in the situation. Now, m1 and m2 are the masses of the objects producing the gravitational attraction, while r is the separation between the two massive objects and we measure this from the two centers of mass of each object. Please remember this is not measured from the surface of the objects rather from the two centers of mass. Now it's important to note that the force produced is the same for both masses in the situation and this resultant force will cause the objects to accelerate towards each other because gravity is an attractive force. Now this resultant force will cause an acceleration because F equals ma 
but the acceleration experienced by each object may be different as it, as it depends on the mass of the object because F equals MA, so A is equal to F over M, Newton's second law of motion. Now for Newton's law of gravitation, we know F is equal to G, M1, M2 over R squared. But what are our assumptions in this particular equation? Well, the first assumption is that the masses are point masses. The second assumption is the objects have uniform density and the third assumption is that there must be a vacuum between the two objects. So just to clarify, Newton measured the gravitational force between two massive objects and this non-contact force is produced as their gravitational fields interact with each other. Now both objects experience the same force in this concept as they're both massive objects inside a gravitational field. Now both objects have a resultant force which acts on them causing them to accelerate but the size of the acceleration can be calculated with Newton's laws of motion and because we know A is equal to F over F even though they both have the same value of F, they may have a different value of A because they may have different masses. The next topic we're going to look at is now gravitational field strength. Now gravitational field strength can be shown on gravitational field diagrams as the density of, gravita of the gravitational field lines. So the gravitational field strength is the force per unit mass experienced at a position in the field. So you'll notice that for radial fields the gravitational field strength changes at different places whilst in a uniform field the gravitational field strength is the same everywhere. Now we know this because the field lines are parallel to one another and evenly spaced, whilst in radial fields the field lines spread out with distance as the sphere of the field is increasing with distance. Now the Earth's gravitational field is radial overall but can be considered uniform close to the Earth's surface because you can't observe this curvature of the field lines on that scale. Now, gravitational field strength is a vector quantity. It always points towards the center of the object producing the gravitational field. And the unit of gravitational field strength, which is given the symbol small g, is newtons per kilogram. Now, in a uniform field, as we assume the density of field lines to be constant, we can assume the gravitational field strength to be constant, which is what we assume with the surface of the Earth. And this allows us to use the standard equation for gravitational field strength to calculate the gravitational field strength close to the surface of the Earth, where G, the gravitational field strength, is equal to F, the force exerted on the object, divided by M, the mass of the object. So as stated, F is the gravitational force experienced by an object inside the field. M is the mass of the object experienced the gravitational field. Now, as this indicates that G is a force divided by a mass, it can also be considered an acceleration because acceleration is also a force divided by a mass. Now in a radial field, as the density of field lines decreases with distance by a factor of 1 over r squared, we must assume the gravitational field strength does this also. Now we can't, therefore we can't assume the gravitational field strength stays constant when you move great distances to or from a massive body. Now this is reflected in the gravitational field strength equation for radial fields, which is g is equal to big G times by big M over r squared. Squared. Now big G is the universal gravitational constant, big M is the mass of the object creating the gravitational field, and R is the separation between the object in the field and the object making the field. Now the value for gravitational field strength, small g, at the surface of the Earth is 9.81 newtons per kilogram, but this value will decrease as you move off the surface of the Earth, and it will decrease by a factor of 1 over R squared. Now, now you can observe this gravitational field strength separation graph for a planet like the Earth, just any spherical planet which has a, 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 a uniform density. Now if you were to tunnel through the Earth's Earth towards the core, the gravitational strength would decrease linearly until it reached zero when you were at the center. Now essentially you'd hover in the center of the Earth if you reached it and it was hollow. Now conceptually this is because all of the mass will be pulling you equally in every direction, making your resultant force due to gravity zero, meaning you wouldn't accelerate in any direction. Now we can also show this mathematically. Now if we assume our planet is a spherical shape, we know its volume is equal to 4 over 3 pi r cubed. 
Now, we also the density of a sphere, like a planet, will be equal to density is equal to mass over volume. So we can make mass the subject and rearrange and, and pop in the uh, volume um, equation and pop it into this equation. Say the mass is equal to 4 over 3 pi r cubed times by rho. So what we can then say is we know that g small g is equal to g m over r squared so we can sub in our equation for big m which we just worked out as so and we can cancel through so we get our equation for the gravitational field strength of a planet like the earth to be 4 over 3 big g times by pi times by rho times by small r so what this is telling us is that within the earth's surface when big r is bigger than small r so big r being your separation so either the radius of the air planet and small r being your separation, the gravitational field strength g is directly proportional to the distance r from the centre of the planet. So let's now look at gravitational potential. Now, if we consider a gravitational field produced by a mass, we know that any other massive object placed inside of the gravitational field will become a store of gravitational potential energy. This is because it's produced as a result of the resultant gravitational force acting on the object due to being in the field. So this energy is due to the attraction produced between the masses. So this gives us the concept of absolute gravitational potential. This is the gravitational potential energy stored per unit mass due to the, the object being placed at a point in the gravitational field and we give this quantity the symbol big V. Now we can set the absolute air gravitational potential to be zero at any place but the position we choose to set this at is at infinity. Now we define infinity as a region outside of the gravitational field. Now the reason why we do this is because uh, outside of the gravitational field, any particle or massive object outside of the field will feel no force from the object producing the field and so therefore is no longer a gravitational potential energy store. So the, gra the absolute gravitational potential is the energy stored per unit mass in an object due to it being in the gravitational field. Now we know the equation to be V is equal to minus gm over r, where big G is the universal gravitational constant, big M is always is the mass of the object produced in the gravitational field, whilst r is the separation between the object in the field and the object making the field, which again links in via the centres of mass, not the surfaces of the object. Now to clarify, this is not the inverse square law, so rather when the distance doubles the potential halves, when the distance trebles the potential decreases by a third because the potential and the separation are inversely proportional. So we know that V is directly proportional to 1 over R. So as mentioned before, when the distance to the centre of mass of the field doubles, the potential halves. Whilst the distance to the centre of the mass of the field triples, the potential decreases by a factor of 3. Now gravitational potential is always considered to be a negative on the surface of a mass and increases with distance from the mass. This is down to the fact that gravity is always an attractive force because energy needs to be placed into an object to escape a gravitational field because gravity is always attractive. Now, therefore, if we want to reach infinity, which is outside of the gravitational field, which we just said before, we define as zero, we've got to place a positive value of energy into the object to overcome this attraction. So therefore, gravitational potential must be a negative value if you're putting something in to get to zero. Now, we can also look at the relationship between gravitational potential and distance from the centre of mass of the object producing the field. Now by using tangents we can find the gradient of any point of the graph. Now in this case the gradient is going to be the change in potential divided by the change in the separation which we call the potential gradient. Now the potential gradient is actually 
another name for the gravitational field strength because if gradient is V over R and we know that GM over R is um, going to be V, well we can therefore say the gradient is GM over R divided by R which is therefore going to be GM over R squared which is just the equation for gravitational field strength. So in your gravitational potential distance uh, graph your gradient will give you the gravitational field strength. Now, it's important to note that any massive object in a gravitational field becomes a store of gravitational potential energy. Now, this is considered a scalar quantity because gravitational potential energy is stored in an object. Now, it's not considered an absolute quantity as it's not, it's, sorry, it is considered an absolute quantity because it's not dependent on any other factor except the gravitational field. Now, gravitational potential is the work done per unit mass to move an object from infinity to a point in the gravitational field. Now, like we said before, at infinity, we have defined the gravitational potential to be zero because the object is not in the gravitational field. Inside the gravitational field, the gravitational potential is non-zero as it's now become a gravitational potential energy store due to it being in the field. So let's just clarify. Absolute gravitational potential is the energy stored per unit mass due to an object being placed inside the gravitational field. Gravitational potential is the work done per unit mass in an object in moving an object from into the gravitational field from infinity. Now this means that gravitational potential an absolute gravitational potential will always have the same magnitude. But this leads to a fundamental concept in physics, that moving an object into different values of potential, whether that be from infinity to inside the field or from different places from in the field to another part, part in the field, needs for work to be carried out. So if we consider a gravitational field, the dashed lines in a gravitational field diagram represent the different potentials found in the gravitational field. Now objects can move between different areas of gravitational potential, but this requires work to be done on the object. Now we say an object has moved due to a potential difference. So the potential difference or delta V is calculated by working out the difference between the potential areas the object has moved between. So in this case if we're moving from 180 joules per kilogram to 300 joules per kilogram well we know that the potential difference is 300 minus 180 so it's 120 joules per kilogram. Now as we know that the potential difference is the work done per unit mass needed to move an object we know this occurs because the gravitational potential is the energy at each level per unit change. So as we know, the potential difference, delta V, is equal to the work done required to move the object, delta W, over the mass of the object. So you go delta V equals delta W over M. Now we can rearrange this to make delta W, the work done, the subject of the equation. So we can say the work done is equal to the mass times by the change in the potential or the potential difference. So this equation tells you that the work done needed to move an object between two points of, a gravi uh, between two points of gravitational potential difference in a gravitational field. Now the M term in the equation refers to the mass of the object moving, not the mass of the object producing the field. So it tells you that the work done needed to move an object is directly proportional to the potential difference if the mass of the object remains constant. Now we can show this idea with the following graph. So on this graph we've got the force needed to move an uh, uh, move a one kilogram mass and on the on on the on on the um, x axis we have the separation from the center of mass. Now in this case the area under the line for this gr graph gr graph because the force needed to move to move one kilogram mass is just the gravitational field strength gives the work done needed to move an object through a gravitational field. Now work done is a scalar so this value is always considered to be a positive. Now if we go back to our previous diagram as we said before 
The dashed line shows the plane in the field where the gravitational potential is the same. So for example, on this topped dashed line in the diagram, the potential along this line is always going to be 300 joules per kilogram. Now, as the potential along the line is always the same or equal, we call this a line of equipotential. Now, work is needed to be done to move an object between planes of different potential inside the field. But if there's no change in potential along a line or plane of equipotential, this tells us that no work is done if the object moves along this plane. So it's important to note that work is always needed to be done to move an object between planes of different potential. But if there's no change in potential along a plane of equipotential, a mass can travel along this plane without any energy being transferred, without any work being done. Now, lines of equipotential are always represented by dashed lines. Now, again, remember that no work is done when a massive object travels along an equipotential plane. Now, the lines of equipotential are always found at 90 degrees or perpendicular to the field lines of the gravitational field. Now, you would be expected to deduce the lines of equipotential from gravitational field line diagrams. Let's now look at the orbits of planets and satellites. So any object undergoing circular motion will experience a centripetal force. Now, a centripetal force is a name given to the overall resultant force experienced by an object. Now, we only consider the resultant effect of the centripetal force. So any object undergoing circular motion will always have a resultant centripetal force acting towards the center of the circle. So for example, the Earth orbiting the Sun. So we know that the Earth will always have a direction of motion tangential to our Sun, the star. So as it orbits, the Earth changes direction because it's moving in a circle. So it means its tangential velocity is changing because its tangential direction is changing. So therefore it means it's accelerating. And we know from Newton's second law, F equals MA, so if there's an acceleration due to a change in direction, there is a resultant force. Now remember that acceleration and this resultant force are directly proportional. Now this resultant force causing this circular motion acceleration is called the centripetal force. It is literally the center seeking force. It always acts towards the center of the circle. So in this situation, the centripetal force causing this orbit is the gravitational force. So a centripetal force produces circular motion. Now any object such as a planet will want to move in a straight line in the same direction unless a resultant force acts on it. This is called inertia which comes from Newton's first law of motion. However the centripetal force always acts towards the center of the orbit because the centripetal force acts perpendicular to the motion of our object. So any force which becomes perpendicular to motion is a centripetal force. Now the there are many different examples of centripetal forces, such as the magnetic force, the electrical force, or the gravitational force. Now, as the force acts at right angles to motion, it will not affect the speed of the object. So centripetal forces cannot change the speed of an object. They can change the direction of the object. So centripetal forces, such as the gravitational force in orbits, can cause acceleration by changing the path of the object, not its speed. So centripetal forces cause acceleration by deflection. Now, this concept of inertia in one plane of motion and the centripetal force acting in the other plane of motion at 90 degrees combine together to form the path of circular motion. So it can be said that the centripetal force provides an acceleration towards the center of an orbit, whilst inertia prevents the body from falling into the center. So the two effects combine to ensure the object follows a circular path. So this means if the centripetal force was removed, the object would move in a straight line in the same direction it would move off into a tangent it would revert back to the laws of linear mechanics so it's important to note that any object undergoing circular motion such as an object in orbit will experience a centripetal force now we know the equation for the centripetal force is f equals mv squared over r but in this instance of a of a object orbiting another object the centripetal force is the gravitational force which is F is equal to GM 
m1 m2 over r squared like we saw earlier in the video so as they are the same thing we can equate the two equations so we can say mv squared over r is equal to g big m m over r squared and it can cancel through some certain terms so you can say v squared is equal to big g big m over r so therefore v is equal to square root of big g big m over r now this gives us a velocity or a speed. Now we also know that speed is equal to distance over time. Now in this concept of a circular orbit, we know that in one time period, or big T, that the distance travelled is the circumference of an orbit, which is 2 pi r. So therefore we can say that T is equal to 2 pi r over the speed or the velocity of the object. So we can now substitute these two equations together. So we can now say that t, the time period of orbit, is equal to 2 pi r over the square root of big G big M over r. So we can now therefore say 2 pi times by r times by square root r over the square root of big G big M. So we can now work this through and say t squared is equal to 4 pi squared r cubed over G M. Now if you'll notice 4 pi squared big G and big M are all constant in the situation because big M is the mass of the object produced in the field which is not going to change so therefore we can say that the only two factors that can change in this are T squared and R cubed so therefore we know T squared is directly proportional to R cubed and this is Kepler's law of orbits so we can use Kepler's law of orbits to work our properties of an orbit and body so as we know that T squared is directly directly proportional to r cubed, it shows us that the greater the radius of a satellite's orbit, the slower it will travel, because the longer its time period will be. So the greater the radius of an orbit and body, the longer its time period. And it also allows us to compare between orbit and bodies, because we can say if we have two objects, object A and object B, because these t, t squared and r cubed always ratio each, with each other, you can say that t squared over r, r cubed for A is equal to t squared over r cubed for B. And if you're given three out of the four terms, you can work out that final term. Now we can also consider the energy stores of an orbit and body. So all orbit and bodies have two energy stores. So the total energy of an orbit and body is equal to the kinetic energy store plus the gravitational potential energy store. Now the kinetic energy store is due to the movement of the object, whilst the gravitational potential energy store is due to the position in the field. So for an orbit and body, the total energy must stay constant at all times. So if your kinetic energy store increases your, gravi your gravitational potential energy store would decrease which tells us that when the orbital radius decreases the orbit and body speeds up and in the other way if the kinetic energy store is decreasing well therefore the gravitational potential energy store must increase to keep the total energy constant so this is indicating to us that when the orbital radius increases the orbit and body starts to slow so finally for a circular orbit Orbit, the orbital radius is constant so it tells us that the gravitational potential energy store is constant so therefore the speed of the orbit is constant because the kinetic energy store is also constant now we know our certain equations now or we can make this more mathematical so we know that the kinetic energy store equation is equal to a half mv squared whilst the gravitational potential energy store equation in this context is big G big M over R now we've got to use this equation and not mg delta h which is what you may have used at GCSE because this is a radial field over a large distance so big so small g would change so you can't use it in this particular equation now if an orbit and body changes radius then the change in kinetic energy is equal to the change in gravitational potential energy so we can say a half mv squared is equal to big g big m uh, small m over r so this allows you to work out the new velocity of the body or the new orbital radius of the body depending on what you need to work out now we can also use the concept of energy stores to work out the escape velocity from a gravitational field 
Now we define the escape velocity as the minimum speed an unpowered object needs in order to leave the gravitational field of an object and not fall back into the field. So we basically we assume that if an object escapes the field, it reaches infinity, it will have a gravitational potential energy of zero. Now when in the gravitational field, any gravitational potential energy of an object is negative. So to reach infinity, zero, a kinetic energy is given to the object. So this increase in energy comes from the kinetic energy store increase in the object. So once again, we can equate the two energy stores. So we can say a half mv squared is equal to big G, big M, small m over r. But remember here, we're assuming that only this is the minimum kinetic energy needed to just escape the field. And there's no excess energy left after escaping the field. So this is the same as the work done to move the object from infinity to the surface of the object. Now we're assuming that all of the kinetic energy is given at the start of the journey at the takeoff of the satellite. Now we're also assuming that there's no dissipative forces acting on the object in its journey out of the gravitational field, i.e. there's no air resistance, which you know will not be the case. Now we can then rearrange our equation of a half mv squared equals big G big M small m over r to make v our subject. So we can say v is equal to the square root of 2g big m over r so this this works out for us the escape velocity of the gravitational field now you'll notice that small m the mass of the object trying to leave the field has cancelled through so this tells us the escape velocity is the same for all masses in the same gravitational field it only depends on the object producing the gravitational field and the distance from the center of the gravitational field now remember in this equation r is the distance from the center of the field not the surface of the planet the object is on now, as this is a velocity, the direction of your velocity is out of the gravitational field. Now, in reality, this value is always higher than an orbital velocity of an object in the field. Otherwise, the object wouldn't be orbiting, it would have escaped the field. Now, there are a number of different possible stable orbits you can have in a gravitational field. The first type is a synchronous orbit. That's when an orbit an object has an orbital period equal to the rotational period of the object it is orbiting. When this is for the Earth, this is called a geostationary orbit. Now, a geostationary orbit has an orbital period of 24 hours. Now, to achieve this, the orbit of the object must be in the plane of the equator. So it means our orbit an object will always be directly above the equator so it will uh, be in the equatorial plane now we also know that the geostationary orbit will have an orbital period of 24 hours and therefore so it's always above the same position on the earth in the orbital plane so in the equatorial plane it must have an orbital radius of 42,000 kilometers which is 36,000 kilometers above the surface of the earth because remember that orbital radius of 42,000 kilometers takes into account distance from the center of mass which is from the center of the earth now it's also important to note that this satellite moves in the same direction as the earth rotates now these orbits are used for communication satellites that's because the satellite stays fixed in comparison to the surface of the earth so signals can be easily sent to them now a low orbiting satellite is a satellite where which are between 180 and 2000 kilometers above the surface of the earth now satellites with a polar orbit move in a plane at which is at 90 degrees to the equatorial plane and pass over every point on the earth as it rotates beneath them now these low orbit and satellites are cheaper to launch as they don't they'll move as much on takeoff and receive less powerful transmissions because they are closer so this makes the satellites useful for communications for weather and for monitoring sites however because these satellites are very close to the surface of the Earth and orbit at a faster period than the Earth rotates. So it means that an individual satellite would not cover all of the Earth. So you need to use multiple satellites to work together in a network to achieve constant coverage. Or an individual satellite can be used to map an entire surface without it take a longer period of time. Now weather and mapping satellites have a polar orbit going from North Pole to South Pole or vice versa, which allows them to scan multiple parts of the Earth over a period of time. 
So let's summarize what we've learned about fields and gravitational fields in this revision session. So fields uh, lead to the following. You've got the concept of a force field as a region in which your body experiences a non-contact force. You should recognize that a force field can be represented as a vector and the direction of which must be determined by inspection. Force fields arise from the interaction of mass, of static charge, or between moving charges. And you should be aware of the similarities and differences between gravitational and electrostatic forces. The similarities are that they both have the inverse square force laws that have many characteristics in common in the use of field lines and the use of the potential concept and equipotential surfaces. But the differences are that masses always attract, but charges in electrical fields may attract or repel. We know Newton's law of gravitation. Now, gravity is a universal attractive force acting between all matter, with F is equal to G M1 M2 over R squared. Now, the gravitational field strength is indicated by gravitational field lines, and as it's a force per unit of mass, it can be given as G is equal to F over M, or for a radial field, big G M over R squared. We should also know gravitational potential, so an understanding of gravitational potential, including the zero value at infinity, an understanding of gravitational potential difference, and the work done in moving a mass M is given by work done is equal to mass times by the potential difference. We understand equipotential surfaces and the idea that no work is done when moving along an equipotential surface, that V in a radial field is given by the equation V is equal to minus G M over R, and the importance of y to the negative sign and the graphical representations of g and v with r and we know that g is equal to the gradient of the vr graph and that you can work out the potential difference as the area under the g against r graph and finally you know the orbit appeared in speed related to the rate of a circular orbit and the derivation of t squared uh, this direct proportional to r cubed you've got the energy considerations for an orbit and satellite the total energy of an orbit and satellite escape velocity synchro synchronous orbits and then the use of satellites in low orbits and geostationary orbits to include the plane and the radius of the geostationary orbit so i hope you've enjoyed this revision session on gravitational fields which is part of aqa a level physics paper 2 and thank you very much for watching and as always have a lovely day